and welcome to a virtual tour of South Bend's Bowman Cemetery. I'm Travis Childs, your host. I'm the Director of Education and the St. Joseph County Historian at the History Museum in South Bend, Indiana. Thanks for being with us tonight, so let's get started. South Bend pioneer Jacob Bowman gave the name to the cemetery in 1835. Originally, it had comprised about a half acre and was originally designed as a final resting place for South Bend's local Dunkerts or German Baptists. When Ireland Road was widened to four lanes, there was a cemetery called Rohrer Cemetery, which is still there. It is in the 600 block of East Ireland Road. They had burials there that were in the way of widening Ireland Road. And so those graves and their residents were removed and reburied throughout Bowman Cemetery. Just to the north of Bowman Cemetery, this cemetery is called Rose Hill Cemetery. It's completely separate from Bowman. Rose Hill Cemetery is the final resting place of St. Joseph County's Jewish community members. is Abraham B. Frick. Mr. Frick was born July 5th, 1820 in Westmoreland County, Pennsylvania. He traveled with his parents from Pennsylvania to Stark County, Ohio in 1826. He became a young man, eventually marrying Sarah Kring on September 2nd, 1841, and this union produced 10 children. Thirteen years later, Abraham, Sarah, and their kids moved to St. Joseph County, arriving here in about 1854. During the Civil War, Abraham served in the 21st Indiana Battery Light Artillery and saw action in the Battle of Chickamauga and Chattanooga. Abraham continued farming and served a stint as South Bend's Justice of the Peace for several terms. Abraham Frick was one of St. Joseph County's founding pioneers and died on July 14, 1902, at the age of 82. Abraham Frick, in this photograph of the Frick Summer Family Reunion, they are sitting right in the middle. Uh, the old gentleman and the older lady are sitting in two chairs right there in the center. That's Abraham and Sarah Frick. Henry Dunker was born in Hamburg, Germany on October 2, 1860. He came to St. Joseph County in 1879 and engaged in the making of boats and tin smithing. Henry was a boat builder in the South Bend area for 30 years. He married Claudia McCullough on July 8, 1909 when he was 49 and Claudia was 22. On June 13, 1900, Henry wit witnessed the capsizing of a small boat that tossed three teenagers into the St. Joseph River. Henry sprang into action and used one of his hand-built boats to try and save the female teenager, but was unsuccessful. Family members recorded that this haunted Henry the rest of his life. His wife eventually died and he remarried Elizabeth and they are both buried here in Bowman Cemetery. When Henry death occurred on February 14, 1937, the South Bend Tribune wrote, and I quote, Hank Dunker, as he was known to his many friends, came here from the Black Forest to Germany. Metal worker, boat maker, historian, and naturalist, Hank was known and loved by many pioneer families of South Bend. Hard working and thrifty, he had saved enough in a life of self-denial and thrift to take care of himself in his declining years. Then came the mad days of 1929, and his entire life savings were swept away in one move when the banks closed. The beloved old man, unwilling to accept charity, unwilling to let any one of his host of friends know of his predicament, died alone with the one friend who knew and understood him, his dog. From a prominent active citizen, Mr. Dunker evolved into what is in fact a recluse. Henry was also an amateur scientist. 
He had a large collection of Native American artifacts that he had found in the Kankakee Marsh area, which is south and southwest of South Bend. He had also found an almost complete mastodon skeleton buried in the marsh also. He died peacefully in his home at 947 Lincoln Way East at the age of 76. This is the final resting place of Elizabeth Ziegler. And as you can see in the upper left-hand corner, uh, their family's uh, monument uh, did have that red marble ball on top of it. But as is the case in some of these cemeteries, uh, it has been vandalized and pushed off of its pedestal. But Elizabeth was born in Clay Township on November 28, 1841. Miss Ziegler was actually born Elizabeth A. Stuckey, daughter of James and Rebecca Stuckey, and was born just north of the Stuckey Schoolhouse, which was named her, for her father. Stuckey School was located in Clay Township at the northwest corner of Ironwood and Douglas Road. It's no longer there. It was demolished in 1966. Elizabeth married Charles M. Ziegler on February 7, 1861 in Clay Township. Charles would become one of South Bend Street Commissioners. Mr. and Mrs. Ziegler lived at 624 South Michigan Street and they had one child. Elizabeth died in her home on January 12, 1927 at the age of 86. Mr. Jacob Bowman was born in 1802 and came to South Bend from Ohio in 1831. He built a farm on the south side of South Bend at the northwest corner of what is now Ireland Road and Miami Street. This plat of land was donated to the city of South Bend in 1922 and developed into what is now Urson Golf Course. What is now the clubhouse of the golf course was originally constructed as the Bowman's family barn and built by Samuel Bowman in 1867. By the time the golf course opened in 1925, the barn was already 70 years old when renovations started turning it into the clubhouse. The eight foot high stone masonry around the foundation of the barn, now the clubhouse, cost Jacob Bowman 300 bushels of wheat or around $900 in today's money. Many of the original beams from the barn are visible inside the clubhouse. The beams were hewn from trees that were found on the property, and some of the beams were 60 feet in length or more. You can see that in the upper right-hand picture. That's actually the interior of the Elk Cart, or the, excuse me, the Erskine Golf Course Clubhouse, which used to be Jacob Bowman's barn. Jacob Bowman was also a preacher in the local Dunkert Baptist Church. Jacob was the father of both Samuel and David Bowman, who became prominent members of South Bend Society. Jacob Bowman died in 1838. And you can see at the lower left-hand corner, that is actually Jacob Bowman's actual land deed for that plot of land that is now Erskine Golf Course. This is the final resting place of David Bowman. David Bowman was born in Dayton, Ohio on November 9, 1825. When he was six years old, his parents, Jacob and Christina Bowman, set out in a wagon pulled by oxen to the south side of South Bend. David was raised and worked on a farm that would later become Erskine Golf Course. He inherited the farm from his father, Jacob. David was married twice. On October 9, 1849, he married Elizabeth Stull, who died January 27, 1875. That marriage produced one child. On September 9, 1876, David remarried to Luzetta Fox and had a son, John A. Bowman. David Bowman died Thursday afternoon, February 23, 1893, after being sick for three days. The pallbearers at his funeral included several locally prominent men in the South Bend community. Men like David Leeper, John Ziegler, George Locke, William Rupel, Joseph Ziegler and Elisha Rupel. And Elisha Rupel, he was born in Pennsylvania on October 29, 
1827, the son of Peter and Christina Rupel. He was two years old when the Rupel family left Pennsylvania and traveled to Ohio, where they spent six months before settling in Elkhart County in the spring of 1830. In 1831, the Rupel family traveled once again to St. Joseph County and settled in Center Township. After attending the schools of the day, Elisha bought and cleared a farm of his own in Green Township. He was married to Jane Vanderhoof, July 25, 1853. Unfortunately, Jane was driving a buggy in downtown South Bend when a new electric car passed her and frightened the horses, which took off running. Both Jane and her daughter, Clarissa, were thrown out of the carriage, with Jane suffering a concussion that caused her to lose consciousness and quickly pass on July 25, 1900. In his later years, Elisha was sickly and died on May 22, 1911, after a two-year illness at the age of 83. Elias Rupel was the younger brother of Elisha Rupel. Elias was born in Center Township on February 23, 1835. Because his father Peter died while Elias was young, he began assisting his widowed mother Nancy with the large family. He continued living with his mother and helping run the family farm until she died. After the death of his mother, Elias married Mary Locke on January 29, 1885. Elias became the town trustee of Center Township and helped organize the St. Joseph Valley Grange, which was a farming organization that was not only a social group, but helped local farmers set prices on agricultural products that they produced and sold. Elias Rupel was the last of his family to pass. He passed away on February 9, 1928 at the age of 92 from bronchial pneumonia. And you can't have a tour of a South Bend Cemetery without talking about a Studebaker. This one is Henry Studebaker. Henry was born in Gaysburg, Pennsylvania on October 5, 1826. He was the sixth child in a family of 13 children born to John and Rebecca Studebaker. When Henry was nine years old, his family moved from Gettysburg to Ashland, Ohio, in a wagon that John Studebaker had made. John was able to construct this wagon because he was a master blacksmith by trade. As a young man, Henry was placed in an apprenticeship with a country blacksmith near the Ashland area. During the summer, Henry worked at the forge, and in the winter, he attended school. He eventually finished his apprenticeship with his father, John. In 1847, Henry had saved enough money to seek his fortune in the West. He traveled as far as Goshen, Indiana, where he found work as a blacksmith. However, he became bored and without any money, he had to walk the entire distance back to his home in Ohio, which was a distance of 222 miles. In 1850, Henry's brother Clem had made a trip to South Bend and settled there. The following year, the whole Studebaker family followed Clem's lead and traveled in two wagons to South Bend. In 1852, Henry and Clem, with their joined funds of $68, opened a blacksmith shop at the corner of Michigan and Jefferson Street under the name of H&C Studebaker. Clem and Henry worked very hard to keep their business afloat. However, the physical and mental stress of working day and night had taken its toll on Henry. Henry sold his remaining shares of stock of H&C Studebaker to his brother John Moeller, or J.M., and bought a farm on the southeast side of South Bend. Henry Studebaker lived the remainder of his life as a successful farmer and died March 2, 1895. In the picture to the far right, you can see what is called the Studebaker Block Building. When this picture was taken, Studebaker had already left the corner of Jefferson, Michigan, and moved and built a new factory or a new office building down along the tracks on South Lafayette Street. Um, this building, as you see it in this picture, is a men's wear store, um, but it had not changed, it hasn't changed much since the Studebaker brothers uh, were there. Um, this building would eventually 
have the roof cut off. They added another floor, I believe, and that became part of the Kresge building. And some of you may remember uh, Kresge's downtown. The person in this picture is not August Bayer, the South Bend resident. This is actually Germany's uh, emperor, Wilhelm I. And that is where he lives, in his palace uh, in Berlin. Now, August Bayer was born November 1st, 1842, in the Pomeranian area of Germany. While a young man, August was one of the most experienced fresco painters in Berlin and had worked on the palace of Emperor Wilhelm I. In 1870, August immigrated to America with his wife Louisa and son Paul. He continued his career as a fresco painter and decorated churches and public buildings in Chicago and La Porte. Unfortunately, most of his frescoes were lost when the buildings August worked in burned to the ground. Even August's home burned down. However, he kept at it and continued with his painting. Unfortunately, the chemical fumes from the paints and varnishes he used took a toll on his health and he had to quit his career as a fresco painter. Through determination, he decided to try his hand at growing vegetables and flowers and managed to accumulate 40 acres of land close to the Sample Street Bridge, which is now where the South Bend Farmer's Market now sits. August Beyer opened the first floral shop in South Bend, but the public wasn't receptive to it and the business failed. Mr. Beyer then went west to Seattle for health reasons and came back to South Bend after two months. He restarted his flower and plant farm and built one of the most up-to-date flower shops in Indiana, which he called, of course, Buyer Floral Shop. It was located at 103 East Jefferson Boulevard. His oldest son, Paul, took over ownership of the floral shop after his fa father's death. August's other son, Herman, was a landscape architect and was superintendent of the South Bend Parks Department. Herman also designed the landscaping for Leaper Park. August F. Beyer died in South Bend in 1920 at the age of 78. James Coker was born November 23, 1838 in Tennessee. After becoming an adult, James settled in St. Joseph County. When the Civil War started, James enlisted in the 102nd U.S. Colored Infantry Troop, which was originally formed as the 1st Michigan Colored Infantry. The 102nd was formed on February 17, 1864. The 900-man unit left Detroit on March 28, 1864. This regiment was composed of all-volunteer blacks, and they lost about 10% of their men during the 19 months they served in the Civil War. Not much is known about post-war life for James. Beyond, he was given the rank of corporal after the war. He also got married and had several children. Corporal James Coker died May 25, 1910, and was buried in Beaumont Cemetery, but had an unmarked grave. However, in January 1940, the U.S. War Department authorized the purchase and installation of a proper military tombstone to mark Corporal Coker's grave in Bowman Cemetery. It's unusual in this part of the uh, United States to actually have um, folks who lived here uh, serve in the colored troops. Herman Dolly was born in South Bend on June 7th, 1905. At the age of 19, he enlisted in the military and continued in the service, creating for himself a military career. He was stationed at the St. Lucia base in the British West Indies, where on November 9, 1941, he went swimming in the ocean, and when he dove into the water from a public dock, he hit the rocky bottom and broke his neck and back. Herman was immediately taken to the base hospital, where he died two days later. His body was returned to South Bend, where it was buried in Bowman Cemetery with full military honors.
Captain Charles H. Bruce was born in Lagoda, Indiana around 1840 and was working on his widowed mother's farm at the outbreak of the Civil War. On November 22, 1861, Charles went to downtown Lagoda, where he enlisted as a member of the 58th Indiana Infantry and was quickly elected to the position of first lieutenant. After seven months in the field, Lieutenant Bruce was promoted to the rank of captain, filling a vacancy in Company K. In the late afternoon on September 19, 1863, the 58th Indiana would see action at the Battle of Chickamauga, Georgia. The 58th would become heavily engaged in action around the Tabler Viennard Farm. The battle here was very violent and confusing. At one point, the 58th had to cross a fence near the Vineyard home as a Union artillery unit was in wild retreat. The artillery unit went right through the 58th. The company and Company K, along with two other companies, became separated from the rest of the regiment. Captain Bruce and Company K tried to advance against a storm of lead. They then attempted to make a stand and hold their ground. Survivors of the ensuing battle stated that at this point in the fight, the smoke was so thick from small arm and cannon fire, they could hardly see anything. The fighting around the Vineyard Farm would soon become a hand-to-hand -hand battle. This battle continued into the evening. It was sometime during these actions that Captain Charles Bruce was mortally wounded by two gunshots. He would die the next day on September 20th, 1863 and he was buried back in Bowman Cemetery. Philip Neitzel was born in 1909 in South Bend. As a young man, Philip had become a Boy Scout and enjoyed all the outdoor activities that marked the duties of the Scouts. On Saturday, March 25, 1922, Philip's Scout Troop had traveled to Magician's Lake in northern Cass County, Michigan, to do some late winter boating maneuvers. Vern Murphy, the troop scoutmaster, two other adults, and five scouts set out in an 18-foot metal boat equipped with a motor. When they made it out into the center of Magician's Lake, an unexpected wind began to blow, and the boat, being designed to ride low in the water, became suddenly swamped and sank to the bottom of the lake in mere seconds. Because the boat sank so quickly and the water was still freezing, not one passenger in the boat survived. It was one of the worst scouting accidents this area has ever seen. Three men and five local Boy Scouts died in the accident, including Boy Scout Philip Neitzel. The town of South Bend threw together a huge funeral procession for all the Scouts, and Philip was buried here in Bowman a few days later. Several weeks later, there was a legal inquest into the accident, and ultimately no one was found to be at fault for the accident. John Reeves was born in Greene County, Ohio, on September 27, 1837. At the age of nine, John traveled with his parents to St. Joseph County. In 1864, John enlisted for duty in the Civil War, becoming a member of the 48th Indiana Volunteers, serving under the leadership of Colonel Norman Eddy, another famous South Bender. During his time in the war, John marched with General Sherman through Atlanta and on to the Carolinas. John was honorably discharged at Indianapolis and returned to South Bend. Prior to the war, John had married Amanda Owens in 1862, and they had two children. After the death of Amanda, John Reeves married Martha Luther and had four more children. John Reeves is most famous for building and operating the Reeves Hotel, which was not a hotel in our modern usage of the word, but more like a resort. It was located on Sycamore Road, just north of Crumbstown. The hotel sat on four acres of forested land, and they served very fancy cuisine. Mr. John Reeves died in 1917 at the age of 80. Alexander Smith was born in Center Township on July, January 26, 1839. Alexander's father, Colonel John Smith, had served in the War of 1812. After attending the common school of the day, Alexander attended the University of Notre Dame for two years. 
In 1859, Alexander journeyed to California and then on to Oregon, where he bought and sold cattle for four years. After selling his cattle business, he traveled to Nevada, where he prospected and labored in the silver mines. In 1871, Alexander returned to South Bend and took up farming, eventually clearing and planting over 200 acres. He also, upon his return to South Bend, married Emmeline Myers, and they had three children. Alexander died April 14, 1909. John Schrader Stull was born in Jennings County, Indiana, November 21, 1821. He was one of 11 children. The Stull family moved a couple of times, but finally settled in Portage Township on an 80-acre farm in 1830. John married Marguerite Locke on March 2, 1857, and they had five children. Mr. John Stull died in 1907 at the age of 86. Stoll Street is named after their family. I'm showing you this marker uh, because I got a lot of I get a lot of questions about it and why it looks the way it does. It's a special gravestone called a white bronze grave marker. The Monumental Bronze Company of Bridgeport, Connecticut produced sand cast zinc grave markers sold as white bronze from 1874 till 1914. The company's product is in cemeteries from coast to coast, both in the United States and Canada. Usually there are just two or three examples in a cemetery, if any at all. Zinc grave markers stand out in a field of stone markers because of their characteristic blue-gray color. After the sections were cast and assembled, they were sandblasted to roughen the surface, then treated with a metal finishing process called steam bluing, which consists of covering the surface with a thin film of linseed oil, then hitting the surface with steam under a minimum pressure of 50 pounds per square inch. The metal is nearly 100% pure. It weathers very well, and monuments made from zinc frequently look as good today as they did when they were first installed just like this marker of the Bailey family. They age better than marble and are equal to the lasting qualities of granite. The markers were sold with the claim that they would last a long time, were about a third less expensive than the equivalent marker carved from stone, and were modern and progressive. Their main flaw is that zinc is brittle, so the markers can be easily broken. Also over time, large markers creep or their panels sag in, and so they require an internal structure to support them. Most of the markers have bolt-on panels so that an older monument could be kept up to date with newer burials in that plot. The panels themselves were made through 1939, even though the monuments were not. A special tool looking vaguely like a screwdriver but with a negative rosette bolt head where the end of the screwdriver blade should be, was used to loosen and tighten the cast zinc nuts, as you can see in the four corners of that panel of the Bailey family listing all of the family that are buried there. Uh, these were very popular. There's a bunch of them in South Bend City Cemetery uh, all over. There's also a, quite a few in Sumption Prairie Cemetery also. All right, that's Bowman Cemetery. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. I want to thank you for viewing uh, our virtual cemetery tours this summer. Uh, we hope to be able to have in-person cemetery tours next year. We hope you had a good time. We hope you learned a little bit about uh, Bowman Cemetery. Uh, thanks again. If you need to get a hold of me, you can give me a call here at the museum or you can send me an email at any time. Thanks a lot. We'll talk to you later.